Welcome to Let's Play House of Hell by Steve Jackson, a thrilling fantasy adventure in which you are the hero. Uh, there's the front cover. There's the inside cover. Just show the front cover again, it's really good. There's the inside cover. Um, okay, I'll just read out the uh, the blurb. Okay, yeah, this is a PDF. Okay, um, taking refuge in the infamous house of hell has to be the worst mistake of your life. Um, the dangers of the torrential storm outside are nothing compared to the blood-curdling adventures that await you inside. Who knows how many hapless wanderers like you have perished within its gruesome walls. Be warned, tonight is going to be a night to remember. Two dice, a pencil and an eraser are all you need to make your journey. You, you decide which way to go, which dangers to risk and which monsters to fight. Okay, I of course will be using the old trusty dice program and a, um, and a text document to write everything down as I've done before. Okay, um, yeah, this is um, not like other fighting fantasy books. Um, it isn't in, in a fantasy sort of um, wizards and magic setting. Um, this is in, uh, yeah, this is a modern day setting um, and the, the game mechanics are very slightly different from uh, the other two books I've done, Warlock of Firetop Mountain and Portal of Evil. Um, so I'll explain about them. Okay, how to survive the House of Hell. Now, the House of Hell is a little different from previous fighting fantasy adventures. You start your adventure unarmed, with no provision or potions, and you have to avoid being frightened to death. Before embarking on your adventure, you must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses to see how brave, lucky and resourceful you are. You must use the dice to determine your initial skill, stamina and luck scores. Adventure sheet, blah blah blah. You are advised either... yeah, advised to record it on adventure sheet. Okay, uh, roll one die, add six to this number and enter this total in the skill box on the adventure sheet. Okay, let's do this now. Um, dice program, so roll one die, so we need one and we need um, a six-sided die. There we go. Does that say die or, or dice? Yeah, it did say die. Right, so so one die, um it's put a number of dices, but it means it means dice. Um and it's a six sided one, a cube. So let's roll that now. And we get a two, brilliant. So let's add um six to that and put that down as our skill. So that is a, uh, an 8. Okay, um, in this adventure your starting skill is less because you are unarmed, but you will have the opportunity to arm yourself. That's correct, we will. Uh, roll both dice, add 12 to the number rolled, and enter this total in the stamina box. Let's do that now. Um, okay. Here we go. Ooh, ooh, we get an eight. That's not bad. Not bad at all. Um, not perfect, but not bad. Um, slightly above average, which is uh, seven. Um, yeah, so eight. Add twelve to that. Did they say? Yeah, eight. So we get twenty. Uh, uh, we get twenty stamina. So let's put that down now. Good, I'm glad I got good stamina. Okie dokie, right, next one. There is also a luck box. Roll one die, add six to this number, and enter the total in the luck box. Let's do that now. So just uh, uh, just the one die. Um, two again, brilliant. Um, really irritating, I keep getting low scores. Um, right, put that in luck. And we have eight luck. I hope we don't. Uh, rely on that too heavily. Okay. Um, for reasons that we that will be explained below, skill, stamina, and luck scores change constantly during an adventure. Blah blah. Yeah, we, we've done that before in the last two books. Um, 
Luck and evil are facts of life in the devilish domain you are about to explore. Okay. Battles. It's the same it's the same deal as the last two books. Um roll two dice, add it to their skill, and that's their attack strength, and as you, you do the same view your attack strength and who is the greatest one uh, that gets an attack in. This it's the same thing, then you can use luck like before, which I never do because it's a waste. Um, until they're reduced to zero, which means death. Okay, this is the interesting thing in this book. Uh, uh, that there's a fear score. As well as surviving your adventure by ensuring that your stamina never drops to zero, in the House of Hell you must also avoid being frightened to death. Before you begin your adventure, roll one die and add six to the result. Let's do that now. Hopefully we, uh, we get a really good score here because... Um, as far as I know, you need high, you need a high fear score. Anything lower than nine will mean you prob pro probably die. So, so I'm going to have to. Hopefully, I will roll a three or more. Otherwise, I don't think it's possible to complete the game. So, hopefully, I'll roll a um a three here. Um. Right. Here goes nothing. Oh, excellent, we get a five, thank God. Alright, so let's put that down um, in, in the fear box. Now, um, that is is uh, is the maximum that, uh, that we can get. So, if I just put 11 max like that, because we have to put the number down each time we get a fear point, and if it reaches 11 then we're dead, that's how it works. So I'll have to write down 1, then 2, then 3, then 4 every time we get some fear points, and if it reaches 11 that means we're dead. Yeah, the trouble is um, I don't think it's possible to go through the game, complete the game, uh, without accruing I think, um, I think 8 fear points, so if you want to complete the game, you can't roll a two. You have to roll a three or more to ensure that you get at least nine, uh, a maximum of nine fear points. Um, so yeah, let's continue reading. Okay, um, this total will give you the maximum fear score you can bear. Your fear score is the number of points you can take before being frightened to death. During your adventure, you will come across situations where you must, for example, add one or two, etc., fear points. Your fear score starts at zero, and you must add fear points as instructed in the text. If your fear score reaches the maximum, as rolled initially, see above, then you are frightened to death and must end your adventure. Note that fear works in the opposite way to normal skill, stamina, and luck scores. You start with zero and increase your fear score towards your maximum, rather than subtracting as you do with the other scores. Escaping. Yeah, you can escape and lose two stamina points. That's the same deal as it was last time. Fighting more than one creature. Yeah, the page will tell you how to do it. Okay, um... Weapons. You begin the House of Hell adventure with no weapon. As with other fighting fantasy adventures, your skill score reflects your combat ability with a weapon. So before you start off on your adventure, deduct three points from your skill score and note this starting skill. Do not, however, change your initial skill, as this is still used to determine the maximum skill you have, and is also used if you must make rolls ag against your skill. If you find a weapon, which will be identified with capital letters, during the adventure, the text will tell you how many skill points uh, the weapon allows you to add. These points are added to your starting skill, not your initial skill. So you have to uh, deduct three, so let's put that down to five now. Uh, luck, yeah, it's the same thing as before. Using luck in battles, yeah, we know that. You have to take one away every time you, yeah, you test your luck. Um, um, your skill, stamina, and luck scores may change during your adventure. Your skill will increase from starting skill if you find a weapon. Your yeah, uh, your stamina will drain as you fight creatures and may be restored by eating or resting as instructed by the text. Your luck will run out as you must deduct one luck point each time you test your luck. Occasionally, a particularly 
Lucky you find or encounter may restore some of your luck. Your fear score is built up as you go through the adventure. Each time you get frightened, you will add to your fear score. Occasionally, when you get the opportunity to relax, the text may instruct you to deduct points from your fear score. Note that any bonuses you are awarded can never be used to exceed your initial skill, stamina and luck scores, nor make your fear score a minus number. <coughs> Hints on play. There is one true way through the House of Hell, and it will take you several attempts to find it. Make notes and draw a map as you explore. This map will be invaluable in future adventures and enable you to progress rapidly through your unexplored sections. Remember to make a note of any advice you receive, and write down any messages or special reference numbers you are given. Some rooms are death traps, and others are chambers of horror. Be warned! It will be realised that entries make no sense if read in numerical order. It is essential that you read only the entries you are instructed to read. The one true way involves a minimum of risk, and any player, no matter how weak on initial dice rolls, should be able to get through fairly easily. I don't think that's true uh, regarding uh, the fear score. I think they just copied and pasted this from uh, the other books. But the fear score, I don't think you can get through with, with, uh, with a maximum of eight. May the power of good go with you. Here's the adventure sheet. Okay, now here we get to the story. Here's the background. Uh, the rain spatters the windscreen relentlessly. You can see no more than a watery gloom as you strain forwards over the steering wheel to see the road ahead. Although the wipers flap valiantly, they are, uh, they are fighting a losing battle as the rain drives harder and harder. Your foot eases off the accelerator. The headlights struggle to light up the road. Damn, you curse the white-haired old man who sent you off along this bumpy track. Probably he meant the, the second turning on the left, or even a right turning, the old fool. Perhaps this is his idea of a joke. After all, didn't you notice a mischievous glint in his eye? Something vaguely sinister? But what sort of nonsense is this? So you've taken a wrong turn and got caught in a downpour in the night. The rain will ease off soon. It can't possibly keep up this deluge for long. And then you'll be able to... Watch out! You spin the wheel frantically to the left to avoid the figure who, from nowhere, shows up in the headlights. The car bumps and jolts as it bounces over the rocky roadside and thumps into a ditch. You collect your thoughts. You are unhurt, but, but shaken. Then you, you remember what has happened. The body. You must have hit the figure which appeared. There was no way you could have avoided him. You spring out of the car, praying that he is still alive. <coughs> Your clothes soak up the rain as you hobble back to the road. In the darkness it is difficult to see anything, but there is no sign of a body. You consider the situation. Are you certain that it was some one and not a trick of the light? Yes, you can re remember the arms held up in fright as the car collided and the look of anguish on his face. His face. There was something familiar about that face. A man you recognised. An old man with white hair. Your heart leaps. No, impossible. With a shiver of fear, you race back to the car, jump inside, force the key into the ignition, and twist it violently. The starter coughs, splutters, and dies. You hit the key again, but this time a single shudder is all the engine can manage. You grasp the wheel with your hands and shake it desperately, as if to force some life into the car. But the battery is dead. Your car is certainly not budging from the ditch tonight. Your situation is hopeless, but now the plight of your car is paramount. Where can you get help? You passed a garage at Mingleford, but that was some twenty miles away. As if in answer, a light appears in the distance. Someone has switched on a bedroom light. What a stroke of luck! It was at least fifteen miles back that... It was at least fifty miles back that you passed the last house, and you happened to have broken down just a short distance from someone's home. You button up your coat and open the door. 
From outside the car you can see the building more clearly. Just ahead on the left a drive winds up to a large house. It is a good five minutes walk away and by the time you reach it you, you will be drenched. But how else can you call the garage? You can't afford to miss tomorrow's appointment. No. Go you must. Anyway, uh, you'll probably be able to dry off inside after phoning the garage. You slam the door, turn up your collar and set off for the house. A flash of lightning lights it up clearly for you, but in your preoccupation with the rain the warning from above is wasted on you. The house is old, very old, and in a shocking state of repair. The light in the window is flickering, most likely an oil lamp, certainly not electric, and you don't notice a face that might have turned you back anyway. There is no telephone line going to the house. Oh, not a fact. Uh, not a face. Sorry, a fact that might have turned you back anyway. There is no telephone line going to the house. As you climb the steps to the front door, little do you realise what fate has in store for you. Tonight is going to be a night to remember. Now turn over. There's a really good picture of the house there. And here's paragraph one. You climb the creaking steps up to the front door and pause to catch your breath. Even though you ran all the way up the drive from the car, you are soaked through. Your feet are particularly wet. Judging by the number of puddles you stepped into in the dark, the drive needs a small fortune spending on repairs. But under the porch you are out of the storm, and you brush the rain from your clothes before turning towards the door. The rain is still pelting down, but an eerie silence hangs in the air. No lights are on downstairs. You step back off the porch to check the upstairs window which attracted your attention earlier. Nothing. No lights. The whole place seems to be deserted, but then you remember the time, five minutes to midnight. Everyone in the house has probably gone to bed. An owl hoots in the distance and a shiver runs down your spine. The situation is a little scary. Here you are, in the middle of nowhere, at some strange, run-down old house, about to wake up whoever lives inside at midnight. They certainly won't be too pleased, but you have no choice if you are going to make your appointment tomorrow. You must reach a telephone to call for help. Um, you step up to the front door. From the left-hand side of the house, a dull glow catches your attention. A light has been turned on. You breathe a sigh of relief. At least someone is awake. You consider your options. There is an elaborate knocker in the middle of the door and a bell pull hanging down to the right. Will you wrap the door with a knocker, pull the cord, or creep round the house to investigate the light? Okay, so that's our first choice. We are going to wrap the door with the knocker. So turn to 357. Here we go. A few moments later the door handle turns slowly <coughs> and the door opens. Standing in the doorway is a tall man dressed in a dark suit with tails. His long face is solemn. Yes, he asks indignantly. You smile nervously and explain your situation. Your car has broken down, you need to reach a telephone and you are soaked to the skin. The man's face remains expressionless. Come in, he orders. The master is expecting you follow me. He leads you into a, a reception hall and tells you to sit down a while uh, tells you to sit down while he informs his master of your arrival. Turn to eight. You sit down in a solid carved chair and look around. The reception hall is certainly not what you would have expected from the outside. It is elegantly decorated with rich tapestries and fine oak panels. A number of portraits line the walls. A sturdy 16th century table is set against one wall. Will you wait for your host to arrive, study the paintings, or hunt for a telephone? We're going to wait for the host to arrive. It's the best thing to do. 277. Here we go. Footsteps. Someone is coming. The tall man you met earlier walks in, opening the door for another tall man dressed in a purple smoking jacket. 
May I present Lord Kelnor, the Earl of Druma, the butler announces. The Earl holds out his hand, and you shake it. His grip is strong, and his eyes pierce yours. His lips widen to a soft smile. You begin to tell him of your predicament, but he holds up his hand. Please, I can see that you have been caught in this filthy storm. Let us sit by the fire, and we will see whether we can help. Franklin's. Tell the cook to prepare some food for our visitor. You protest that you do not wish to be any trouble, but your host ignores you and leads you into a drawing room where a fire is burning. You take off your coat and sit down. The heat of the fire makes you feel comfortable once more. Franklin's returns with two glasses of brandy. Will you relax, drink the brandy, and ask if you can use the telephone, or will you wait to see what he asks you? We are going to drink the brandy. 394. <clears throat> the fire and the brandy warm you and you begin to feel more relaxed. You may deduct one fear point if you have any. We don't need to do that because we don't have any. Uh, you explain to the Earl what happened on the road and that you would like to use his telephone to call the local garage. I'm afraid our telephone line came down tonight in the storm, he replies. We will have it repaired tomorrow morning. In any case, the garage would not come out here at this hour. But don't worry, you are perfectly welcome to spend the night here. I'm glad of the company. T tomorrow, Franklin's will take you into town. Ah, here is Franklin's now. The butler comes back in to announce that a meal is ready. You both rise to go into the dining room. Turn to 309. The dining room looks magnificent. A long table stretches between two fires and a silvery cutlery. A rich red wallpaper covers the walls and the room is lit by a sparkling chandelier bristling with candles which hangs from the ceiling. You take your seat and the butler moves behind you to offer you wine. Will you take white wine or red? We're going to choose the red. I think the white wine is bad for some reason. I can't remember why. 395. The wine is impeccable, a fine vintage. Soup follows, and then you may choose either lamb or duck for your main course. Or you can tell your host that you have already eaten and you are not hungry. We're going to choose uh, the lamb, so 196. I don't think choosing the duck uh, is any different, to be honest. A rack of lamb is brought in on a silver platter. The smell is delicious. You both start to eat and talk. The Earl asks you about your job and your reason for being in such an out-of-the-way place in the middle of the night. In turn, he tells you about himself and his family. Turn to 28. The Earl of Droom is the last survivor of his family. His estate stretches for miles around the house. At one time the estate was prosperous with many tenant farmers cultivating his land and providing a healthy income for his family. But things started to change. His sister died at the age of 32 under mysterious circumstances. She was found dead in a clearing in the woods with strange marks on her neck. News shoveled fast and the ignorant peasants started muttering about witchcraft and black magic. In their eyes the house was cursed. Pure superstitious nonsense, of course, but gradually the farmers moved to new pastures, avoiding the estate. By now you have finished your meal. Franklin's returns to offer you fruit, cheese, coffee and brandy. Will you take fruit, coffee and brandy, cheese, coffee and brandy, just cheese and coffee? We're going to choose the fruit, coffee and brandy. 224. Franklin's brings them to you and you finish off your meal. Well, my friend, says the Earl, you must now be quite tired. It is well past midnight. Franklin's will show you to your room. You thank him and follow the butler out of the dining room. This way, if you please, he says as he leads you up a magnificent wide staircase with carved wooden banisters. A landing at the top leads to various different rooms, each with a name plaque on the door. He takes you to one which reads Erasmus Room and opens the door, wishing you a good night's sleep. Turn to five. 
The bedroom has been prepared for you. The room is not large, but a huge mirror appears to double its size. Crisp white sheets have been folded back on the bed, and a warm fire burns in the fireplace. The door closes as the butler leaves the room, and you walk over to the fire. Your situation is a little worrying. If you don't get going quickly, you will never make your appointment. But if it is true that there is no phone you can use, what else can you do? Maybe you should just hang your wet clothes in front of the fire and climb into bed. Or would you rather leave the room? We're going to leave the room. Uh, 59. Or at least try to leave the room. The door is locked. It seems that your hosts certainly don't want you prowling around the house. Do you want to try to break down the door or climb into bed? If you prefer, you could pretend to go to bed, switch out the light and wait to see what happens. Okay, we are going to break the door down. Turn to 79. Roll two dice and compare the total with your skill score. If it is higher than your skill score, initial skill score, 106. If it is equal to or lower than your skill score, turn to 128. So roll two dice. Here we go. Let's hope we get lucky. 11. I don't think that's good, is it? What are the odds? 5 and 6. 11. Odds, uh, odds would be... Uh, one out of eighteen uh, to get an eleven. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, one out of eighteen. There's two ways of getting eleven: five and six, or six and five, and uh, uh, thirty-six um, possible outcomes. Anyway, um, yeah, so that was one out of eighteen chance of getting that, and I annoyingly got it. Anyway, um, so yeah. It's uh, higher than our skill score, so we're going to turn to 106. So 106 we go. Probably just take damage or something, I imagine. You charge at the door with your shoulder. The door shudders but holds firm and you are left nursing an aching shoulder. Deduct two stamina points. You realise that the door is made of solid wood and you are unlikely to break it open without doing yourself an injury. Turn to 158. Hundred and fifty eight we go. And we have to deduct that stamina, so put this down to eighteen. There we go. So hundred and what was that? Hundred and fifty eight, yeah. Yeah, you lost that then. You can hear slow footsteps approaching your room. They stop outside the room and a key rattles as it unlocks your door. You must quickly decide whether to jump into bed or pretend to be asleep, or hide behind the door to surprise whoever is about to come in. Hide behind the door. 373. I think we need to try to break the door down so we get the, uh, the opportunity to hide behind the door, I think. The door opens slowly and a man shuffles into the room carrying a glass containing a clear liquid. He appears to be bent double and his movements are slow. As he gets nearer to the bed you realise he will soon notice that you are not there. Do you want to nip out of the room quickly and lock the door behind you? Or will you leap on the man and attack him? you are going to leap on the man and attack him, 399. I think he's a hunchback or something if I remember. Yep. Your visitor is a hunchback, and he is both surprised and frightened as you leap on him. Resolve your battle. Alright, so we have to fight a hunchback. When you have reduced your stamina to 4 points or less, turn to 220. So, we're fighting a hunchback. Um, enemy attack. My attack. Um... Yep, that's it. Um, so let's roll the uh, the, di uh, the dice for him first. Oh yeah, he is. Um, oh yeah, I have to put skill stamina, don't I? Skill seven stamina seven. So roll two dice and add it to seven. Here we go. That's fifteen. 
My one is 4 plus... No, that's not going to be good, is it? 4 plus 5, 9, so... 15, 9... That's uh, pretty annoying, you've got a good score there. 15... God, my skill is so uh, damn low. Alright, so he knocks off two points. There we go. Alright, let's try again. We, we don't have to... We have to get two... We have to get three points off him, really. Nine, brilliant. That's uh, 16. I get seven. So that's 16 and 12 there, so... Uh, this isn't going well, is it? 16 and... 12, so he gets another two points off, so I'm down to 14. Alright. Off we go again. He gets an 8, that's 15. And I get 11, thank God. It's 11 plus 5 is uh, 16, so that's 16, 15. I just win that one. Just. So, 15, 16. So, he's down to 5 now. Do another one. Um, nine, brilliant. And I get two. Right, I've, uh, that's nine. That's uh, sixteen. Sixteen to seven. Uh, terrible. So I'm down to twelve now. I'm going to die from this. I mean, blimey. Um, okay. It's a six. That's uh, thirteen. I get nine. That's 14, thank God. Blimey, that was close. So, I get uh, 14, and he gets 13. Right, there we go. And that's got him down to 3, so he, he will... That's all I need to do now, so 220 now. Okay, here we go. The poor, miserable creature pleads for mercy. It is I who am uh, pleading for mercy here. He was, he nearly, he got eight points of health off me. He is such a pitiful sight that you step back as he grovels on the floor. He will do you no harm and thanks you continually for sparing his life. I should be thanking him. Do you now wish to leave the room, locking him in behind you? Or will you try to force him to answer your questions? Um, we're going to try to force him to answer questions, obviously, because we need answers, really. 234. Ooh, that's horrible. Um, he is terrified of you and agrees to answer your questions in exchange for his miserable life. Do you wish to ask him how you can escape from the house? About the people in the house, or what is happening in the house? We're going to ask him about the people in the house. 308. The people, he asks. Ah, yes, the people. Of course, tonight is the night. There are many people here. The Master is holding a special occasion tonight, and his friends are here. All are friends of the Master. That is all except the one in grey, for he has betrayed the Master's trust, and he will be punished. Yes, punished, before the night is out. The Master put him in the Asmodeus room, and he's promised to let me watch, but you have nothing to fear if you are a friend of the Master. You are a friend of the master, aren't you? Perhaps he'll let you watch too. The hunchback is giggling with glee at the, th at the thought of the night's activities. You've gained all the useful information you will get out of him, so you leave the room, locking him in. Turn to 350. Who is this master? You are on a landing overlooking the entrance hall. To your right, the passageway ends at a door. To the left, the, the landing turns right past a couple of doors. Do you wish to turn to the right, or would you prefer to follow the landing around to the left? We're going to follow the landing around to the left. So, 257. Here we go. You consider your best plan as you walk down the passageway. You turn right along the landing, and two doors are on your left. The first has a Zazel written on its nameplate, and the second, Mephisto. Do you want to try either of these rooms? If so, you may enter the Azazel room by turning to 358, or the Mephisto room by turning to 298. 
Otherwise you may pass both these rooms and walk along to where the landing turns right by turning to 287. We're going to enter the Azazel room, so 358. Here we go. Uh, the door opens and you peer into the room. You quickly check that there is no one inside and are relieved to find it's empty, but full of clutter. It seems to be a crude scientific laboratory of some sort. A brass telescope points through the window towards the sky. Charts and mathematical tables are pinned to the walls. A human skeleton hangs from a hook and the bench is covered with glass vials and apparatus. They look like priceless antiques, and they were probably all made in the, in the last century. Do you wish to investigate the room further, or would you would you prefer to leave? There's the uh, the room. Okay, we're going to investigate the room further. So, 117. I think we might get a weapon here, if I remember. You step into the room and close the door behind you. A squeaking noise from one corner makes you jump. When you walk over, you are relieved to find that the squeaking comes from three rats in a cage. You keep your ears peeled for sounds of visitors as you investigate the contents of the room. Do you wish to look through the drawers, examine the liquids in the glass vials, or look through the cupboards? We are going to examine the liquids. So, 341. Actually, I, don't, I can't remember if we get a weapon here or not, I don't know. I thought we did, maybe I'm remembering it wrong. At the end of the bench is a rack which holds four glass vials, and each vial contains a coloured liquid. They, l they look like the results of someone's experiment. Are you willing to risk taking a sip of one of these liquids? If so, which colour will you choose? Who would do that? Okay, green, red, clear, or yellow. Okay. We're going to drink the yellow one, believe it or not, so 161. If this seems a little too dangerous, you may instead look through the drawers or the cupboards. 161 then. You uh, you unstopper the vial and sniff the liquid. It smells of lemon. You raise the neck to your lips and, and take a sip. It tastes like lemon juice. You swallow it down and wait anxiously for any effects. Nothing happens, but this is understandable as the effects of this liquid will not become apparent until you have your next fight. The liquid has healing powers and will protect you from injury. The sip you took was strong enough to heal the next two wounds you take. Do not deduct any stamina points for these wounds. Turn to 385, I just note that down. Um, yellow liquid. Um, ignore two wounds. Next two wounds, I'll just write that down. There we go. Okay, turn to 385. The lucky fine, wasn't it? Suddenly your ears prick up at the sound of footsteps coming closer. You nip into the shadows and wait. The footsteps the footsteps stop outside the door and you can hear two voices talking. Hadn't we better ask the master's permission, one asks. Hmm, maybe you're right, and we'd better get a light for the lamps. You breathe a sigh of relief as the footsteps disappear off in the, in the direction you approach the room. You decide it is best to leave before they return, and you open the door on to the landing. The safest way to go, it strikes you, is away from the two visitors. Um, who may return at any moment. If you approach this room from the left, turn to 229. If you came from the right, turn to 226. We came from the right, so to 26. There's another door a couple of meters up landing on the left. This is the door to the Mephisto room. If you wish to enter, turn to 298. Otherwise, you may pass it and head towards two two doors in the corner of the landing. Okay, we're going to head towards the doors in the corner. 287. We don't want to go in a Mephisto room. 287. You walk up to the two doors in the corner of the balcony. The one on your left is named Balthus, and the one in front of you has no name. If you wish to enter the Balthus room, turn to 299. If you would rather go through the other door, turn to 86. If you choose to ignore these doors and continue around the landing, turn to 193. Okay, we're going to go through the other door, 86. Uh, 
Now the door opens into a narrow passageway which ends at a window. There is a door halfway along the left hand side and a sign on the door identifies it as the Diabolus room. If you wish to try this door, turn to 13. If you wish to investigate the window instead, turn to 110. If you're not keen to do either and would prefer to go back through the door and continue along the landing, turn to 193. Um, we're going to investigate the window 110. Curtains are drawn across the window and you approach cautiously. You gingerly pat the folds in the curtain and are relieved to find nothing there. Although they seem to be safe, you are still on your guard as you draw them apart. As you do so, a thunderclap booms outside and makes you jump, but you are safe. A perfectly ordinary window is uncovered. However, the heavy iron bars on the outside are a little worrying. Through the window, you can see nothing but the rain running down the pane of glass, but curiously, the rain is avoiding one area. Could it be that the wind is blowing the rain away from this corner? You bend down to take a closer look. Written in the condensation which has formed on the glass is is a message. You read three words, Mordana in Abaddon. You repeat this message to yourself and then rub it off the window in case anyone else should see it. This message may be useful to you and you will realise when it is. If later in the adventure you want to use this uh, you want to use the message, turn to reference 88. Do not turn to 88 now. Now you must head back to landing and turn left. So let's just write that down and then we'll end the video for now. So I'll just write more, what was it, more Dana in Abaddon and then 88. So that's that done. Um, so yeah. Thanks for watching part one of uh, Let's Play House of Hell. Um, in the next part, I'll be continuing and going to 193. So, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next part, and bye-bye.